Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next episode in my devlog series. So I'm starting to think that I should probably call this my engine devlog series because not a lot of gameplay has been going on, but a lot of engine work has been going on. I do want to make a game eventually once I actually finish the engine part or not finish, but get it to a workable state. But Nonetheless, in this episode, what I'm going to be doing is continuing to port my C++ code. It's actually been a week since I released my last devlog, and it may not look like a lot of stuff has gotten done. Like, the only visually noticeable thing that you can see is a graph now, so it looks like there's, you know, a grid line and everything. But I've done a lot of rework on my event management code and everything, so that events are really good. Instead of pulling for events like I used to, I can now just respond to events uh, using callbacks and stuff, which is really nice. And so I also switched to JillFW instead of writing my own platform code, which was another big move. But yeah, I'm going to show you guys what I have done so far, and then I'm going to take you along as I go to work on this code. Okay, guys, so I figure I will show you what I have done so far. So if I pull up my window, you'll notice that it is mostly the same. Uh, one of the things with this new event system that I can now do is you'll notice if I click on this and I start pressing the arrow keys, I can move around. But if I click off and start pressing, it has lost its focus and so it won't intercept events anymore, which is good because when you're doing something like changing maybe the color or something and you hit a key, you don't want that to actually affect the camera and everything too. And when you're scrolling and everything and just all sorts of stuff like that. So. The new event system has definitely helped in that regard. I was also writing my own platform layer, but I eventually decided it'd be best to switch to JillFW. I had learned enough at that point, and now since I'm using JillFW, you can see that I can move these windows independently of each other, which is really cool because that means that now you can actually have several windows open and you can drag them out of the window completely. And the way this works is I am GUI basically just creates a whole new window entirely and just doesn't give it any decorations except for whatever is rendering on it. So that's how you get this sort of effect. And so this is actually a separate window than this window, but it's pretty cool. So I'll show you sort of like how the event system is a little bit better too real quick. So if I go into my level editor system, um, instead what I was doing before was I was basically doing something inside of my update loop where I basically say if the key debalances is less than zero and they're pressing Z, the key Z, then um, undo. So then I undo a command or whatever, and then I basically check if this key, blah, blah, blah. And I do all that stuff. Whereas now I can say handle key press right here. So I get the key press event and I can handle it. And I can say if the key code that was just pressed was this, then do this. If it was this, do this, which is different because instead of running this every single update, I'm only running this every single time a key is pressed or something. But yeah, that's what I have done so far. What I'm going to start working on now is basically just updating some of the level editor stuff, you know, getting some of these things working a little bit better. Like I've started this settings window where you can do things like, um, you can see this grid is pretty small. So then if I wanted to increase it to be like 64 by 64, then I can do that. And you'll see that the grid actually grows and then I can make it even bigger too. Not sure if you'll be able to see this because of YouTube compression and stuff, but you can do all this and change the grid size dynamically. I want to add other settings and stuff that are just sort of global to the game, to the engine in general. And those will go up into here and you can just access that through here. But I do want to just fix that up, make this a little bit better, you know, fix implementation details and then get it so I can actually start adding uh, resources, textures, different pictures and adding different components to these things. So yeah, I'll update you guys once I get some cool stuff going on again. Right before I let this time lapse start up real quick, I do just want to talk about where I'm at. So at the beginning of this time lapse, I've actually done quite a bit since that last clip you saw, and I've actually completely migrated to Visual Studio, which is why you'll notice I'm working in Visual Studio instead of Visual Studio Code. I've also switched to Premake, which is helping me with my build system, and I've decided to take a different route. Instead of working on textures and resources, I've gone fully into physics. So specifically what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that my physics components are pure structs. They don't have any functionality within them and really separating out the system from the components in my entity component system. 
But that's about it that I'm doing in this clip. And in the next clip you see me, I will be talking about how the physics is going. I'll see you guys then. Hey guys, it is definitely time for an update. I have made a ton of changes, so they just didn't seem very exciting, which is why I haven't really been recording any bits because I was like, I won't go until I have something exciting done and I have just integrated Box2D for physics. So right now I have kind of an integrated approach where I am doing a little bit of Box2D, well, a lot of Box2D, but for things like detecting if the mouse is just clicking inside of a shape, I'm currently just using my own little functions for that. I am probably going to change to complete box 2D since I decide to integrate it though because it's just better in general. But the shape collision detector thing that I have going on is pretty cool. Let me show you that real quick. Okay, so I have imported a sprite sheet that I used for one of my previous projects and I was doing some testing. You can see there's this little red box that sort of gets dragged around with this and that is my collision box. And so I've basically used the image to calculate the exact uh, pixel boundaries for a, an access line bounding box that fits exactly around any pixel image. And so you can see here where it automatically generates a good access line bounding box depending on the image. And then I'm using this bounding box to detect whether you're clicking inside. So if I click over down in this corner, it still detects that I hit it just because it's technically inside of there. Another big thing too that you probably see that I'm using right now, this is Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. So I finally switched to Visual Studio and I'm using Premake now. And let me say it is so much nicer to have everything organized through this. It's just a lot easier to organize my project and everything and make sure everything is going real good. I have Premake generating uh, all of the external libraries I'm using too as Visual Studio Solutions. So you see I have I'm GUI, GLFW, GLAD, and Box2D up here. Of course, I have Ent and stuff, which I haven't added as sub-modules and gotten pre-make working with yet, but I plan on doing that. Then I just have a build.batch file, which basically just generates my pre-make file. And then you see it prompts me to reload the Visual Studio solution if that happens. And uh, all my binaries and stuff go right into the binary folder. And you can see I've got my editor, which is an executable. And then I've got the engine, which is a static library. So all that's the same too. Uh, and for the big change, <laughs> like I said, I integrated Box2D, so physics actually works. I'll set up a little scene real quick actually using what I've got on the engine, because it's pretty cool. You can do quite a few things with it. So I'll drag just a few boxes over here. Uh, I'm going to change this color to green. This will be our ground. Change this color to red. This will just be the differentiation so that we can tell which box is which. And I'm going to add a rigid body, and I'm going to add a box collider to the green one. Then I'm just going to increase the bounds on the box collider and 9.6 is the exact height of this green square. Then I'm actually going to increase its scale so that we've got a nice big ground. Um, I need a, a way to visualize the box collider right now. You can't actually see it around this, which is kind of stinks, but it still works. You'll see in a minute. And then I'm going to go over here and check this as static since this is a static bounding box. This one I don't want to move. It's the ground. Then I'll click up on him, give him a rigid body, and I'm going to give him box collider. Also, he's going to be dynamic, and I am going to say a zero friction, so zero linear damping, and then I'll give him a mass of, say, a 200. And then for his bounding box, 9.6, 9.6 should be good. I'll click up to the blue one, give him a box collider, give him a rigid body. Once again, 9.6 and 9.6 for him. And then I'll give him some friction of zero and we'll give him a mass of 200. What did I give this guy? I'm going to make them different masses. Just Okay, he's 200, so I'll make him uh, 50. So then if I hit play, it will start playing the simulation and you can see that they start falling and he will start tipping over. So you can see this is all working great. And then if I hit stop, it'll just stop the simulation, everything. And I can tweak variables in here. It doesn't reset it to its original state. I've got to work on that still, but 
I can tweak the variables in here. I can say, oh, I actually want to give him a mass of 200 and let's move him up here and I'll give him a mass of 50. Hit play again. And then you'll notice that this guy is going to push him out of the way since he's now lighter. And yeah, you can see that he just affects him a lot more. And last thing I'll demonstrate real quick, if I hit fixed rotation, then that will allow it so that he does not bend or move. So he doesn't start tipping over. Um, even if I bring him back over to like the very edge, he still won't tip over just because I have fixed rotation. And just so that you know that he would, I'll uncheck it again and then drop him and you'll notice that he'll tip now. Okay, but yeah, like this is great progress. Um, I did all that within the engine. You saw it real quickly. I don't really have the scene hierarchy working well and everything. Like you can't click stuff uh, inside the scene hierarchy and stuff. It doesn't actually do anything yet. And you can't like drag this stuff around in here. That's probably one of my next steps. But one of the very first steps I need to do is serialization. Because if I exit out of this and then completely exit out, restart it, you'll notice it. all my progress just disappeared. And that's really annoying. <laughs> so I've been manually doing all that adding components and stuff every single time I need to test this. And that's really annoying. So I'm going to work on serialization, get serialization working on, get some sort of binaries for scenes and also a text like save data file for scenes. That way I can start saving my scenes and loading the scenes. And we can actually start doing more complex like scene stuff so but yeah this is really cool box 2d is awesome it was super easy to integrate saw some horror stories about how hard it is to integrate it but it that was not my experience at all it's just a few steps and i followed this tutorial and it was up and running so yeah i'll update you guys in a bit once i get some serialization working so that we can get some more cool scenes How's it going guys? So like I said, I was going to work on serialization and deserialization and I have gotten that done with flying colors. It works and it works good. So best way to show you this is to open up one of the scenes that I have saved. So I just clicked on my file open scene as you saw there and I'm going to hit my cool scene dot jade and we get this little scene right here. And one of the cool features that I can do with this serialization is First of all, if I run this physics simulation, I can restart it. So I'll hit play up here. It will start running my scene and we can watch it. It's changing the positions and everything. But when I hit stop, it gets reloaded back to its original state, which is just awesome. I mean, this is really starting to feel like an actual game engine. There's still a few glitches I have to fix. As you can see, it's not saving the names of the game objects and stuff. And say I were to change this, like I change this to static. And then if I hit save, and then if I open this up once again, you'll notice that this has actually switched back to dynamic. And that's because I don't have a way to save enums right now, but I'm going to work on that and everything shouldn't be too difficult. So yeah, this is super cool. And I also have the save scene as, so if I want to save this scene as something different, say uh, my cool scene two, and then if I just enter that, then we will notice if I bring up my file browser that we now have my cool scene and my cool scene too and they both contain the scene and if i change something say i make this guy uh green actually let's make him pink and then if i save this if i go and open up my cool scene one you'll notice it switches back to this and then i can switch back here and it worked good and i was watching Cherno recently and he was mentioning how slow Unity's play stop thing is, and I totally agree with him. You know in Unity, when you click play, and it takes a million hours just for it to start playing, like there's no reason for that. If you notice, I press play and I press stop, it literally starts immediately. So yeah, that's kind of nice compared to Unity, where it doesn't. Also, the engine running on my computer literally only takes up 3% of my CPU. If I bring this over, um, yeah, it's taking up 3% of my CPU right now and 5% of my GPU. Like. This engine is very minimal, which is amazing because it means you can develop pretty easily in it and stuff. 
But this is turning into a full-blown physics engine. I can start, I mean, game engine. I can start changing some features on these objects and everything. It'll take effect. It'll actually do stuff. So and I can save it and reload scenes and everything. Let's talk a little bit about how I'm doing this because it is very sketchy right now. It's a minimum viable product. I just got the bare minimum necessary to get this stuff working. So what ends up happening when I click the save button is it calls this save function. Well, actually, first of all, let's go right into it. So you can see if you hit the open scene button, what happens is first of all, I define an out file and then I go through my iFile dialog, which is basically just um, an interface that gets into contact with the OS through an OS specific class. So like if you're on Windows, it'll contact the Windows file dialog system. If you're on Mac, it contacts the Mac file dialog system. And then it calls the Windows specific function so if I went to win32 file dialog.cpp, then you'll notice I have the win32 specific code to open up a file dialog. So it opens that up. I pass it some parameters. I want to be able to filter files by Jade scenes and all files. And I say, if they don't provide an extension, uh, when they click open file, then it will automatically append the .jade extension to it. And then I say application load with that file. So this, if this succeeds, then I go into my load function in my scene, which says, okay, now I'm going to open up the file, which it does using this fi uh, file stream. And then I initialize this JSON object using the N-O-L-H man JSON library. It's a very confusing name. I'll have a link in the description so you can check that out. But it's a JSON library. I initialize it with size and components because I'm just saving components here. And then what I do is I create an output archive which is this thing right here, part of entity or ent right here. And then this basically just goes ahead and calls the serialize function on each component specifically. And so if we wanted to look at an example, render system serialize, what that does is it goes ahead, it uh, gets the JSON from the scene. This is really sketchy. I hate the way this is working. And then it basically just appends all the data. So I append the color using uh, JMath serialize function. And then I say, okay, append the color into my components which is this whole thing right here and then you end up with a file that looks like this if i drag in one of those it just basically says components and then it gives you like the components and you can you notice up here too it gives the entity so each component has a reference to what entity it's actually attached to and that's how i sort of use it when i'm loading and so then when i go to load uh, i basically do all that and then i just dump it to the file and then when you load the file First of all, it clears it. I really hate the way this works too. I wish I could just say like clear everything, but I have to specify every single component. Um, I'm gonna look into a way, if you know entity or ent, if there's any way to just clear all components, that would be great if you could let me know. But then I create an input stream file. So of course I'm loading it. So I get the file that I'm loading it from. And then I create an unordered map for ID keys. Uh, so the entities IDs, because basically what I end up doing is we have these IDs which don't really matter. Uh, so I just create a new, since I'm loading the scene, I just end up creating new IDs for every entity. And then I create a map to map from the original ID to the new ID. And as I go ahead and place in all the components, I just find the correct ID. And this is why I'm saying this is like really janky. <laughs> it is not the best way to do this at all. I'm going to fix this in the future. Just wanted to get it working to see if I could get it working. But yeah, this is super cool. It's starting to feel like an actual engine. You know, you can open up scenes, you can mess around with the scenes, you can play the scenes, and you can pause the scenes. Well, not pause, but you can stop the scenes and replay it. You can save, load. I mean, I'm really happy with this. <laughs> I think that's gonna cover it for this video though. In the next devlog, I'm gonna actually try and start doing the thing that I mentioned I would be doing in this one, which is like, resource management. I kind of do want to get that done, but I may also diverge into C-sharp runtime, like attaching scripts and stuff to these objects. And I got to fix up the scene hierarchy. Just a lot of to-do items. So I'm going to be doing a ton of stuff. I hope you guys stay tuned for that. Uh, if you like this, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next devlog. Thanks.